I'm telling you. Good evening, folks. Good job on that song leading, Mr. John Hutchins. Appreciate it very much. Well, you see a picture of a, uh, an auditorium of a church building. That's where I was last Wednesday night. The preacher there, is his name is Andy Kaiser. And I first met him in Sherman, Texas when he was the preacher there. And they had me out to do a, a meeting for them and let me preach for about three days for them on a weekend meeting. And we've been buddies ever since. And so I get to go to Ninth Avenue every uh, two or three, well, ever so often. Not every year, but almost. Well, I, um, I, I do my thing. I, I, as a matter of fact, I'm there to pretty well promote the university, but also do a sermon. And I, uh, I work through the first chapter of my book, and that goes pretty well. And then uh, they have me back up to offer the invitation. So the invitation song is in its second verse. When here comes an old boy kind of loping, kind of galloping down the, the aisle, and uh, I'm over here, song leader's in the middle, and Andy, the, my preacher buddy, is there. And this guy's running toward Andy, and I'm thinking, well, this guy, not only does he want to get right with the Lord, he wants to do it right now, like in a hurry. He can't wait, you know. And he runs up there, and he grabs Andy by the shoulders, and he's talking in his ear, you know, blah, 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 blah. And uh, Andy said, okay, okay. And so, and he turns around and takes off. And so Andy just shuts the song leader down. And he goes over, and he's a Tennessee boy, and, uh, and kind of, you know, countryfied. And he goes to the microphone behind the uh, communion table. And he said, now, folks, the fire department is here, and they're down in the other end of the building. And we've got a problem, and we don't know exactly what it is. But I'm going to have a quick dismissal prayer. And he said, and then don't run over anybody, but get out. <laughs> Just like, I mean, uh, plain language. I can understand plain language like that. So he said, get on out of here. And so we did. I mean, we left in a hurry. Well, um, by the way, I want to show you a picture of Miss Julia Buffler. She's the lady I was telling you about who's 100 years old and has been at the same congregation for, uh, for 100 years. Her parents took there when she was uh, an infant, and she's been there ever since. And so I told you about her last week, and that's her in the middle. Uh, that's her little sister, who's, that's Mary Hazel. She's 90 years old. And uh, and she's the one. And Mary Hazel is uh, the one who kind of takes care of Miss Julia. Miss Julia's had three falls and broke her hip twice and had surgery. Broke her hip a third time, and they said no surgery, just suffer through it. And so she suffered through it until the, the you know she got to where she can actually walk uh, fairly well. But uh, she's in the wheelchair there because. Uh, they didn't want to risk any falls with her. Now, this is, uh, this is uh, last year's event, our, our big banquet uh, at, for Heritage. And obviously it says 2012 because I don't have any 2013 pictures yet because they're not until two weeks from now. Uh, but you'll see some familiar people there. You'll see Mr. Cosby on stage and, and um, wearing his, uh, he likes to, and by the way, he always, whatever university he works for, he has you to uh, send him, well, to do the, your logo on his clothes. And so he was wearing those, and he had one there called Hello Friend, and he autographed it. You can see his autograph there. And uh, you'll see some familiar faces here that was actually sitting with Mr. Cosby. And, of course, uh, James and Darlene were there. And... Uh, Here's the main man right here talking to Mr. Cosby. And so we had a good, and we're going to have a good time again this year. This year, um, it's uh, Mr. Glenn Beck. And so we're, that's going to create some excitement and tension and draw a big crowd. And you are invited. Several of you are planning to be there. And I want you to know that I appreciate it very much. Notice this says earning money. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's easy to say making money. But if you think about making money, it sounds like something you do, like making a cake. You know, you, you, get, you get these ingredients and you put them all together and you stir it up and you put it in. And, well, that's, uh, that's making or baking a cake. Or it sounds like it's something you do, you know, in the basement with, a, with one of these uh, high-definition printers and you're making some money, you know, counterfeiting or whatever. But earning money, everybody knows what, what we mean when we say earning money. I said this morning that... Uh, most preachers, and, and I'm certainly one of them, talk often about what the Bible says about giving money. 
And the scripture has a lot to say, beginning with Adam and Eve and the sacrifice that they, uh, rather that their sons made, uh, Cain and Abel, and God was pleased with Abel's, but was not pleased with Cain's. And so right away we understand that God is, um, he has some certain standards that he expects when it comes to giving. And that's why I'm so delighted when I see that our contribution is staying on target and even a little bit above our uh, our budget, and that's very, very important. So that just as Thomas prayed tonight, these outreach programs and everything that we're trying to do here to help people and to get the word of, of God uh, uh, not only in this community, to, taught in this community, but in other places as well, it's very important for us to give enough money uh, to make sure that we meet our obligations and we stay on track with our budget. So uh, I, you, I, I've talked a lot about... Uh, giving money, but I've never actually put a sermon together on earning money before. And so this is, this is new territory for me, but it's not new to the scripture because the scripture, uh, is very familiar with, uh, well, uh, is very, uh, prolific, so to speak about how to earn money and how people go about earning money. And of course there's the scripture even mentions some, some unscrupulous, scrupulous ways. You try saying that fast, unscrupulous ways of making money. Or earning money. I'm sorry. I, I, I caught myself in, in my own trap. But I, we're, we want to talk about honorable ways. And so as I put this together, I, um, I, I realized that there are at least three different attitudes uh, concerning material things. And, and one of them is what I call poverty theology. And that is an extreme attitude that some people seem to have, and that is that unless you're poor, you're not spiritual. You got to be poor. If you got any, you know, if you got enough, you got a little bit more than enough to pay your bills, then, then you're just, you know, you're worshiping uh, money instead. Well, that's not true. I mean, uh, as a matter of fact, there are certain people in the Bible that were as close to God as a human being can get, and I'll just use Abraham as one example, and he was rich. Now, the scripture says that God made him rich. And that's going to be a very important part of this sermon tonight. But And so poverty theology says, well, you know, you just ought not to try to, to get ahead. You ought to really be in a financial bind all the time. And that will keep you humble. And that will keep you praying. And, uh, well, that's, that's not taught in the Bible. And then there is a prosperity theology, and that's this business. You hear it on, from the TV preachers a lot, you know, give and get rich. And God wants every one of you to be a millionaire and a multimillionaire. He wants you to be healthy and young and good looking and rich. And God wants all here on earth. Now, he's got all that in store for us over on the other side. That's true. But only the TV preachers get that from the scripture. And by the way, if you cooperate with them and send them a thousand at a time, pretty soon... Somebody does get rich. And guess who it is? It's the preacher who's soliciting that money for himself. Well, of course, in churches of Christ, it's not done like that anyway. When the, when the money is contributed on, the, on Sunday morning, Sunday night, for those who contribute, well, the preachers never see it, never handle it, never touch it. The elders uh, uh, have control of it, and, and they also control the preacher's salaries and all that. And so in the churches of Christ, preachers are not handling the church's money. And I don't know about you, but I think that's very important to point out every once in a while. And because it's, it's, but, but prosperity theology is, is an extreme attitude. It's just too far over on the other side. But then uh, there is what I'd like to call proper theology concerning material things. And uh, it's a balanced approach taught in the scripture. And it involves, of course, hard work and wise decisions and good management and honesty, and uh, trust, and gratitude toward God, and and again, uh, honesty toward our fellow men and toward our employer or employees. Um, I read something the other day that said you can make money, you can earn money, no, you'd be making money, uh, by being dishonest until you get caught. And you will always get caught. And then, of course, that that kind of eliminates that way of of, uh, earning money. Well, um, there are some scriptural records of earning in the Bible, and I want us to notice a few of those. Um, 1 Timothy 5.18 says this, The worker is worthy of his wages, worthy of his hire. Proverbs 14.23, Hard work brings profit, but mere talk 
leads to poverty. Now that's a, that's a wise statement there, isn't it? But let's go to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're looking at verses 11 and 12. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may, be, may win with respect of the outsiders, and so that you will not be dependent upon anyone. And then let's go to Ephesians. This would be Ephesians chapter 4. And we're looking at verse 28. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. And so not only, the scripture says here, should we earn enough money to take care of our own needs and the needs of our family. We should have enough that we can help someone else as well. Well, the only way you can get it, according to the scripture here, is uh, by working. And then there's 1 Timothy 5, 8 that says, uh, He that does not care for his own family is worse than an infidel. And so the scripture says that we are to be industrious people. Uh, just as services was beginning, I... Uh, I reminded myself in Genesis 2.15 that God set Adam and Eve up in this beautiful garden called the Garden of Eden. But he said to them, now take care of this place. Don't sit around idle and let this thing turn into a jungle. Dress it, till it, keep it, keep it nice. Uh, keep it pruned and keep it, you know, trimmed and keep it whatever, you know, whatever you do with, uh, with paradise like that. But he says, uh, don't, 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 don't just, uh, you know, don't go on a permanent vacation. Take care of this beautiful place. I expect you to. Well, um, anyone can do this. You can go to a, a Bible dictionary and you'll find a list of, uh, you can do it on the internet now, but you can find, but by the way, I, I found out that the internet list, they got it from the Bible dictionaries, you know, that uh, were around before the internet list. But you can go to the uh, Bible dictionary and you can find an amazing uh, number of different uh, occupations. Now, I cleaned this up a little bit because uh, uh, there were some of them in there. They, the, it lumps the, the dishonorable ones along with the honorable ones, puts them all together. So I kind of cleaned it up a little bit, even though there's some here that might be a little bit suspicious. But I want to give you just a minute to, you see they're in alphabetical order, just to scan that list. And, and, and by the way, please don't feel that if you don't see your uh, occupation or your expertise or your profession in this list and that somehow you're you know you're not <laughs> you're not with the with the uh, the the scriptural model because this is just the way it was you know up until uh, uh, the scripture was completed and and given to the church and to mankind almost 2,000 years ago and so that's uh, I've got more than I've got three slides embroiderer uh, how about that and uh, here's a gardener and a gatekeeper and a gem cutter, a goldsmith, a governor, a grape picker, a guard, a grinder, a harpist, a harvester, a herdsman, a horseman, a hunter. I'll let you just look at a few of those. Down at the bottom on the right-hand column is merchant. And then a third slide starts with messenger, and then a metal forger, and a midwife, and a minister, a money lender or a banker, a musician. That'd be a great way to make a living. There's only one catch. I can't do it. I don't. Last Thursday night, we had this get-together at the university, and Wayne Kilpatrick, our history teacher, is also a musician. And we sat and sang songs after kind of things after the meal and the games and all that. And it finally it just got down to down to he and I because we could remember some of these old songs. Because we had no music, we had no words, and so we were just going by memory. But he can you know he can strum a guitar and he can do just about any old tune that's been around for a while. We had so much fun. And I thought it'd be great to make a living doing this, except that um, no one would pay me. I don't, I don't have what it takes. But I admire those who do. There's a sheep shearer. 
And there's a soldier, a spy, a treasurer, a trumpeter, a vine grower, a water carrier. Now, I'm qualified to do that. Yes, I can handle that job. A weaver, a woodcutter, a woodsman, a writer. You mean you can make money writing? Yes, you can. As a matter of fact, I heard a man on, uh, on uh, uh, radio the other day talking about how that if you try to write a book about um, how bad things are and how, you know, how... You know, just how bad things. He said you can't sell it. But he said if you'll talk about, if you'll if you'll write a book about uh, uh, having a good attitude and how to be successful and, and, and tell some stories and give some practical teaching. You know, he says you can get rich. You can become a millionaire because people will buy books like that because uh, they're talking about things that they want to know. And so you see some of the ways in which uh, the scripture uh, records how that people were employed and how they went about earning money. Now. There are many ways to earn money. And, uh, you know, you might, if you want to earn some money, you might have to work for nothing for a little while in order to get good at something. And that's what internships are all about. And uh, there there have been a, many a person who started off uh, as a, an unpaid employee, but they became valuable enough to the company or to the employer that uh, they were put on payroll. And so I realize not everyone has that luxury of being able to work for a little while for no pay, but uh, but it is done, and uh, and there are many people have done it. I'm uh, I'm listening to a book by Keith Richards uh, of the Rolling Stones, and it's good. And here's a statement from Keith Richards. He says, the best way to get to the top is to start at the bottom. Now, let me give you the context of that. He's talking about learning to play the guitar. And he says, if you want to be a pro, if you want to be the very best, and he's considered one of the very best, he said, you don't start with electric, and you don't start with an amp, and you don't start with wire strings. You start with what he calls gut, in other words, the old, you know, an acoustical guitar. And he says you learn the fundamentals and the basic. You start at the very simplest and the most, you know, uh, well, fundamental uh, parts of, um, of playing the guitar. And he says you stay on with that until you get good at it. And then you move on to the other, uh, well, like to the electric guitar and things like that. So he says uh, if you want to get to the top, be willing to start at the bottom. And so that's a good principle, I think. Okay, so I want to use the word something now. And every one of these things uh, uh, has a, uh, a particular, uh, well, it ends with something. For instance, make something. Let's go to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. And we're going to look at the Apostle Paul who was a pro. He was a professional. You say, well, wasn't he an apostle? Yes. Wasn't he a missionary? Yes. But he also was a professional and he had a craft or profession. So we'll discover that as we read verses one and following. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew by the name of Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Because Claudius Listen to this. We need to look this up in history because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them. And because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Now, every Sabbath, that's every Saturday, he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. You say, well, wasn't he a Christian? Well, yes, he was. Well, didn't he worship on the first day of the week? Yes, he did. But on Saturdays, the Jews gathered in the synagogues, and it was a perfect opportunity for him to teach them the gospel. And so he went and reasoned with them, trying to persuade them in their own synagogues. Verse 5, when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul quit making tents, and listen to this, he devoted himself exclusively to preaching. Now, there are, there are some men in this audience tonight, and I can think of um, at least three just off the, just right away, who uh, have other ways of earning money. They have uh, full-time jobs or businesses, but they also can preach. 
Michael, did you preach this morning? Yes, he did. And Jim has been preaching quite a bit recently. Alan can preach at the drop of the hat. But these men earn their living another way. But there are also people, Eric is one of them, who exclusively is dedicating himself to, to preaching and to full-time ministry. So you got, you might say, full-time preachers. you got part-time preachers. Paul, for a while, was a part-timer. And then he said, I'm going back to full-time. I'm going to get up every day and all day long. All I'm going to do, I'm not going to be making tents anymore. All I'm going to do is to see what I can do to advance the cause of Christ. I'm going to give it... My, my, my best shot every day. And so I'm just saying you can... Now, don't think that I'm going to preach a little bit about every one of these professions because there are too many of them and we don't have time. And it's already, according to that clock up there, it's already about 12 minutes till 3. <laughs> I'm serious. I just happened to look at the clock and I realized that I got here a lot earlier than I intended to. Uh, you, can, you can build something. And Jesus, of course, was a builder. He's called a carpenter, but you, you realize in... Uh, and, and, and where he lived, they didn't actually do woodwork. I mean, the houses there are not built out of wood. Uh, and, and so he didn't use hammers and nails and a saw and a sander and all that. Uh, but carpenter simply means a builder. And so he and his dad were in the, the building business. Um, and uh, you know, I, know, I know quite a few people who are builders. And, uh, and I've always admired that thing. Well, Jesus was a builder in another sense. Not only did he grow up as a builder, and his dad was a builder, but... Uh, he also said, I came to build my church. Upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against. And so uh, sometimes you can earn money by building something and then repairing something. Um, you go to the book of Nehemiah, and especially in chapter 3, you will see all these crafts, all these families who knew how to do different things. And some of them were masons and some of them worked in metal and all these. And you can find these throughout scripture. But uh, some people uh, repair things. You can find things. You can be a treasure hunter, so to speak. I just heard yesterday that uh, uh, Lafitte, what's his name, Jean Lafitte, uh, buried $20 million in today's dollars in the, in the island around here somewhere. I think I'll go after services tonight and get a shovel and, and go look for some of that. Um, when, I, when I was a kid... And by the way, I probably have said this too many times, but, uh, but it's really, uh, I guess, a source of, uh, it's, a, it's a fine memory for me. But I've done all kinds of work in my life, and especially as a kid. My best friend, who is now my brother-in-law, he and I counted it sport to find some way to earn money. Now, we still like sports. We like baseball and football and basketball and track and all that. But we enjoyed earning money. And I've done everything from sweeping floors to unloading trucks to uh, uh, I've worked in a florist. I've worked in a junkyard. I've worked in a fruit market. I've, I've worked in, you know, I've washed cars. I've washed windows. I've cut grass. I had a paper route. Um, just so many. I, I was all, And my buddy and I, we were always supporting each other. And when all the rest of the kids around us were broke, we always had money. You know why? Because... You know, he sometimes would challenge me and sometimes I would challenge him and we'd say, let's go find something to do, you know. And let's, let's, what we meant was there's some way to earn some money. We'd go around asking people, you need anything done? You need me to take that garbage out? You need me to rake those leaves? You want me to wash your car? And, of course, we were teenagers. We were 13, 14, 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. Um, but one of the things that we would do is that we felt like the world was an abundant world. Because we were kids, and that's the way it looked to us, you see. And um, also, both of us had the kind of parents who would not give us any money. No money. As a matter of fact, if I ever went to either one of my parents and asked them for money, they would say, what, what kind of work have you been doing around the house lately? And, of course, usually around the house, I wasn't doing that much because it didn't pay anything. So I wasn't all that good of a sport around the house, you see. Um, or they would say, I'll tell you what. If you will do this or that or the other, you know, if you'll rake these leaves or if you'll wash the car or if you'll whatever, uh, you know, I'll give you a quarter or 50 cents or whatever, which used to go a long way. It doesn't anymore. But what finding things, my brother-in-law and I would get out and again, kids, we would walk the roads hunting things. And we were particularly hunting soft drink bottles because you could get a deposit. You could take them to the store of the supermarket and get a deposit. 
Um, and, of course, we, we found other things. We found hubcaps so we could sell them at the uh, junkyard. And we found a lot of other interesting things that we could sometimes turn into money just simply by walking the roads and in the ditches. Yes, we saw snakes, and yes, we saw dead animals, and yes, sometimes cars swooshed by a little bit too close. I learned a lot about humanity as a kid by just seeing what people throw out the window. And every once in a while, I really do believe that people did not intend for certain things to get thrown out. And I always wondered if maybe the kid in the back seat threw something out that, you know, on the way back from the store, and they just threw it out, some little boy or girl, whatever. So, I mean, we found, I remember finding a Barbie doll. The first Barbie doll I ever saw uh, was in a ditch. Um, and, you know, beautiful, perfect, you know, in, you know, in its little outfit. I guess it was brand new. And some little girl probably was hanging out the window and letting it fly like Superwoman or whatever. And out it went. And, and so found it in a ditch. So I'm just saying uh, that uh, there, there's all kinds of ways to earn money. And finding things is one way. You can sell things. By the way, the old saying is, is that nothing happens until somebody sells something. And I believe that's true with all my heart. We're going to Acts chapter 16. You know, you can make a fine, fine product. You can manufacture it, and it can, the quality can be good, and it can be beautiful, and it can be useful. But if somebody doesn't get out there and tell others that it's available, it's going to sit in that warehouse. And so somebody's got to get out there and sell something. It's, it's a true in the store. It's true in the, in the field. It's true everywhere. And so and selling is a, uh, you know, I just, I really do admire uh, the, the profession of selling. And I've... I've done a little bit of selling myself. I used, as a matter of fact, when I was in school, I sold Bibles door to door. You learn a lot about people and a lot about yourself by knocking on those doors. And I learned right away that you don't say, you wouldn't want to buy a Bible, would you? <laughs> you don't do it that way. That won't work. You can talk people out of things. But salespeople understand the difference between talking people out of things and solving their problems, you see. Because everybody's got problems. And what salespeople do is that they have a solution to people's problems. So we're in Acts chapter 16. And I'm looking at verse 13. And um, we're talking about... Uh, a woman by the name of Lydia. On the Sabbath, we went outside. Now, this this we that would mean that Luke is mean Luke who is writing this was with them. We went outside the city city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the woman women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer. In purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. She said, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, uh, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. You know how she persuaded them, don't you? She was a sales lady. She was a dealer in purple cloth, and she knew how to persuade folks to come on over to my house, spend some time with me. She had that, she had that talent. She had honed that ability. Well, let's keep reading about, here's a dishonorable way to make money, earn money. Well, maybe this is making money about what I'm about to get into now. Verse 16. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept telling this for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. Well, verse 7, 19, When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone. See, it even says making money there. See, they weren't earning money. They were making money off this young girl who had a spirit, of course, that was from the devil. 
And when the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them there and before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs and unlawful for us Romans to accept or to pray. In other words, they lost their easy money. You remember what I said? You can get by with dishonesty. And you can make money with dishonesty until you get caught. In this case, this guy got caught. The owners got caught. Now, they were abusing uh, this, this young girl in the way they were using her. And she was a slave, the scripture says. And so Paul put an end to that. So you can get by with dishonesty until you get caught. And then, of course, um, uh, you can... Um, you can earn money by, by knowing something, which means you've got to be smart. How do you get smart? Studying, getting education. I know you've heard the story, but let me tell you one more time. This, uh, this would have been in the old days of the big factories and the gigantic machines in America. And this particular company invested in this, this very expensive, complicated, big machine that when it was cooking, man, it really put out the product. But one day... It just stopped cold. One day after the warranty ran out, it stopped cold. Wouldn't run. Well, they all walked around and they looked at it and they jiggled this and they checked that and they flicked this and nothing could happen. And so finally somebody said, I know a man who, um, who worked at the factory where this machine was built. Why don't we call him? They said, yeah, yeah, do that. So a couple of days later, this little man uh, shows up at the plant. He's got this little satchel bag with him. He walks in there to the machine. He studies it, you know. He looks at it, he looks at it this way and that way, he walks around it, he squats down, looks at it like this, and put his hand in his pocket and he scratches his head and he looks all around and thinking, and after a while he's, he stops and he opens his satchel, pulls out a hammer, walks over to the machine and he gets and he puts his hand like he's feeling for a pulse, you know, and he, he gets his hand right there and he, and he goes, moves his hand, of course, and he goes, boink. And he says, now try it. And they tried it, and the machine just started right up. And, man, that thing was running just like the day it was new. And uh, and the owner said, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Send us a bill. He said, I will, I will, I will. And so about a week later, they got a bill for $10,000, $10,000. Well, the owner, when he saw the bill, he just went berserk. He called the man up. He said, you charge me $10,000 for hitting my machine with a hammer? He said, no, sir. I only charged you a dollar for hitting your machine with a hammer. He said, well, what's the rest of it for? He said, that's for knowing where to hit the machine with a hammer, you see. It's that knowledge that's valuable. And there are people, you can get to know something um, that uh, you know that you can you, you could be at the top of your game so to speak you know certain things better than anyone else knows them and as a result that people come to you for the information and they are willing to pay you for the information if you know something that will help them and then of course you can teach something and uh, and teaching of course is a, a noble profession whether it's uh, teaching in our schools or whatever it is you can invent something and uh, and and inventing something is uh, well, you know, usually inventions, whether it be a better mousetrap or whatever it is, is when somebody says they, they want to try to solve a problem. And, and they figure out a way to solve their problem, and then they realize, well, other people have the same problem. Whether it's mice or whether it's, uh, uh, you know, Velcro was invented uh, by the Lord. Because uh, one guy one day was walking through a, 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 a field and he had these thistles stuck to his fuzzy pants he was wearing. And he realized that the thistles had a little hook on the end and the fuzzy pants had these little fibers. And so he says, well, you know, I could. And so he, he, he didn't invent. He just discovered Velcro because that's what Velcro is. It's a series of little hooks and little fuzzy things and they stick together. So you can invent something. You can invest something. This is uh, Matthew chapter 25. Now, I realize you've got to have something to invest, but if you have something to invest, you can earn some money. Jesus said this in verse 14. He says, um, Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. 
To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work. Now what he's doing is investing OPM, other people's money. And so he put that money to work. Um, and gained two other, or gained five more. Verse 17, so also the one with the two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Now you know the rest of the story. Now, the Lord was not pleased with the, the one talent man who didn't put that money to work. He didn't invest it. So that when he came back from his journey, he had the same amount of money that he, that he had when he, when he left. Now he didn't lose any. But he didn't earn any either. And so he was looking to earn money as he was on his way. And so there's just a few ways, but here's a few more. Now here's what we've said so far. You can make something. You can build something. You can repair something. You can find something. You can sell something. You can know something. You can earn money by teaching something, inventing something, investing something. You can earn money by solving something. That means like solving someone's uh, um, problem. And everybody has problems. Everybody needs a solution to some, some, some problem. Um, it's been said that we will be richly rewarded if we can offer a solution to somebody's problem. Or Zig Zigner used to say it like this. You can get anything you want if you will just simply help enough other people get what they want. In other words, putting solutions together and solving a problem, that's the way you do it. So we can earn money by solving problems. We can earn money by serving. I noticed today at lunch that, um, that being a waiter uh, is a noble profession. And those who do it well are a pleasure to watch. Because they just, you don't have to tell them everything you need. They just know. And they keep an eye on things. And, uh, and, and uh, I really think that I would make a good waiter. I'd have to learn. I need some experience. I've never actually been one, except at school when we have. I'm always hustling coffee for people when we have uh, meals at, at our school. But, um, but, I, but that's just a very noble. But then serving or doesn't, ju- it's not just limited to food. There are all kinds of things that we can do and serve and, and, and provide. We can provide something. We can protect something. Uh, we can produce something. We can grow something. Um, farmers are, um, th- th- that's a, uh, you got to be pretty religious to be a farmer because you, you do a lot of praying and, and you're dependent upon on the, the laws of nature, but you're also dependent upon the blessings of God. I noticed just in the last few days that the farmers in America are excited about the corn crop this year. Because the corn crop apparently is going to be abundant because of the way the rain has been spaced. There's been abundant rain this summer, but it's been spaced in a certain way so that it's just just perfect for growing of a corn crop. And so uh, farmers who grow things, I know people, I've known people who grow flowers for a living and, uh, and sell them. There are a lot of things you can do. You can write something uh, and earn that way. You can create something. You can own something. Now, if, if everybody in the church had the ability, and I realize that some people are not suited uh, for it, uh, personality-wise or talent-wise or whatever. And by the way, all these professions I'm talking about are providing that you are of good health. And now, if you've got health problems, that's, that's you know, we're not uh, talking like you can just take one of these professions and run with it. Uh, although some people, I know people who make a decent living, but they're in a wheelchair or they're paralyzed in some way. But still, they found a way uh, to, to, to earn money. But here's what I was about to say. I'd like to see as many people in the church as is possible. By that, I mean have the, the opportunity and the ta- talent and the wherewithal to own their own business. Owning your own business is the very best way to have security. Um, When you're your own boss, you can earn money. And there's a a million, you know, tiny business, small business, business out of home, um, a business that starts out small and grows. Earning your own business, owning your own business is a marvelous way, not only to earn li- a living for your family, but to have something to pass along to uh, your, your, your descendants. And so I would encourage that, young people. I would encourage you to think about 
you know, earning, uh, owning your own business because it's a very, very good way to earn a living. Um, starting something. Now, I don't even know what I mean about that. I just made this list up. You can own something. You can start something like a business or whatever. But it's very important that we understand that. Here's what the scripture says about honesty in Luke 16, 10. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And all I'm saying is, if you want to do well as far as earning a living is concerned, be impeccably honest. And the amazing thing about it is other people become your cheerleader. Once they understand that you are a straight-up person, that you, your word is your bond, if you say you'll do something, you always follow through. You always do it. Or if you can't, you explain, you tell the people you can't, and here's why. But, 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 but a straight-up, honest, straight-talking person who performs exactly as they've promised is a person that other people will, will talk about and promote and say, you want to do business with that guy because he'll tell it like it is and he will always deliver just like he's promised. So that's very important. Now, here is a big, big part of this sermon. That is that God owns it all. And since I've gone a little long, I'm not going to take you to... Uh, uh, to uh, Psalm 24, 1. We'll just read it. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Haggai 2, 8. The silver and the gold is mine, says the Lord. Psalm 50, 10. The cattle on a thousand hills are mine, says the Lord. And then this is a very important thing. God gives us the ability to gain wealth. This is Deuteronomy chapter 8. And again, we won't take the time to read it, but let me tell you what it says, especially in verse 18. He says, it is God who gives you the power to get wealth. And so he's, he's writing this in Deuteronomy chapter 8 to remind the folks then and to remind us now that once we have managed to, you know, to, to get financially secure, don't think that we did it of our own strength and that we just did it by ourselves, but instead remember that the Lord uh, was behind it all and he was the one who is allowing us to do it. He allows us to do it by opportunities and by health and by the intellect that we have and, and the doors that he opens and so many things. Now, money can't do certain things. Even though there is an abundant ways to earn money, money can't buy happiness. Money can't buy love. Money can't buy peace. I'm talking about peace of mind. Money can't buy friends. Money can't buy salvation. Luke 12, 16 through 21. Let's, let's go to this. Now, this is where the, the scripture where this man thinks that he's got it made and he's got everything that he's going to ever need and he's just in great shape and it's all a pie in the sky for him. This is beginning in verse 16. Oh, sorry, I went to the wrong chapter. He told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. I guess not only the Lord blessed him, but the rains must have been spaced out just right. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And then he says, this is how it is with anyone who stores up things for himself, um, but is not rich toward God. And so, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, money can't do everything. It can do some things, but it just can't do everything. James, uh, this is James chapter 4, and I'm trying to quit, folks. I'm just trying to find a decent way to get out of this thing and bring it in for a landing. This is James 4, and we're looking at uh, verse 13. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go to this city and spend a year there, carry on business, make money. There he says, make money, not earn money. Why do you not, do you not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, he says, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will do this and we'll do that and we'll do other things. First Corinthians sixteen twenty says that we are bought with a price. It's not that we bought our salvation, uh, but um, it was bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. 
lottery winners. Uh, it looks like, you know, sometimes that they have hit the jackpot and everything's going to be good for them from now on. This is like Buddy Post, uh, a former cook who won $16 million in the Pennsylvania lottery. Since he won the money, he's been convicted of assault. His sixth wife left him. His brother was convicted of trying to kill him to get the money. The gas has been turned off on his crumbling mansion. He feels lucky to have electricity and a telephone. A couple from Texas, Lynette and Jimmy Nichols, won about $16 million from the lotto. The big money exposed the 12-year-old marriage. It, it exposed the, the fault lines in the 12-year marriage and created several new ones. For several years, they've been engulfed in a bitter divorce court battle over how much money each of them should get. Mrs. Nichols said, after the money, we had about one month of good times and about three years of misery. The money was a curse. It didn't help at all. Mr. Nichols added his view. More bad than good has come out of it so far. Now, the first person in this country to be a billionaire um, started at the age of verse, uh, at the age 23. He had become a millionaire, and by the time he was 50, he was a billionaire. Three years later, at the age of 53, he became very ill. His entire body became racked with pain. He lost all the hair on his head. In complete agony, he could only digest milk and crackers, even though he could buy anything he wanted. An associate wrote, he could not sleep, he would not smile, and nothing in life meant anything to him. His doctor predicted that he would die within a year. As he awaited his death, he awoke one morning with a vague remembrance of a dream he had just had. He could barely recall the dream, but he knew it had something to do with not being able to take any of his successes or riches with him to the next world. He called his attorneys, accountants, and managers and announced that he wanted to channel his assets to hospitals for research and mission work. On that day, John D. Rockefeller established his foundation. The list of discoveries and the good resulting from his choice is enormous. But perhaps the most amazing part of Rockefeller's story is not his decision to change his approach to his fortune, uh, but, but to save his life. He went on from a man who was about to die at age 54 to a man who lived to be 98 years old. And the moral is, once he got his mind right and his attitude right about material things, then his life went much better. Well, that would be true for you and me too. And so the scripture says that Jesus gave himself, paid the ultimate price for our salvation, so we cannot save ourselves or purchase our own salvation. And the scripture says in 1 Timothy 2 verses 1 through 6 that he gave himself as a ransom for all. You see on the screen the plan of salvation. If you need to respond to the Lord tonight, you say, well, what I need is I need more money. Well, I, I, okay, I know you do. We could all use more money. Do a lot of good if we had more money. But I'll, let me tell you and let me remind you what you really, 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 really need. You need to be rich toward God. You need to have your sins forgiven. You need salvation above and beyond all other things. This is the most precious commodity known to mankind. And it's being offered to you tonight through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or if you need the prayers of the church, you'll never find a better time than right now. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, please come now while together we stand and sing.